Hey everybody, a lot of you guys like my uh, video on the abandoned F-14s and F-4 Phantom down there in Temple, Texas. Well, guess what? I found some abandoned A-4s. No, I'm just kidding. These are the parts department or the parts area supplier for all these A-4s which are flyable. Check it out. J.R. Starch. Uh, I'm a pilot uh, on the A-4 Skyhawk. want to take a great opportunity to kind of give you an introduction to the aircraft, something up close and personal from a pilot's perspective. Uh, we've got a few mechanics that so we'll have an opportunity to show you some more technical detail than even I will, but give you a pilot's perspective of the A-4. And what a great opportunity because we've got both a two-seater and a single-seater here together. So a great representation of the, uh, of the Douglas fleet. Uh, originally designed by Ed Heinemann in the early 1950s. It was a replacement aircraft for what was then the primary attack aircraft for the Navy, uh, the A-1 Sky Raider. Uh, the, there was a call out by the Navy in the early 50s to replace it with a light uh, attack aircraft, jet-powered light attack aircraft, and this was Ed Heinemann's creation. The uh, original model, uh, the A-4D, uh, became later the A-4 Skyhawk. We've got a single-seater L model and then a, a TA for uh, J model here and there's some technical differences between them we'll kind of talk a little bit about those to I think to give you an appreciation of the legacy of this airplane and the wonderful folks who've flown and operated the aircraft for many 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 years uh, many whom I hope will watch this and be able to appreciate uh, the legacy that they've left behind so we'll start here with this A4L model single seater the L model was about the fourth in the series. Uh, the first was the Alpha, Bravo, and the Charlie model. And there were some unique differences that when the L model came along that distinguished it from its predecessors. Uh, primarily, the, uh, the avionics hump that you see on top of the aircraft. Uh, spoilers were added. Uh, there were a, a few other features that were added. But they'll also show you some differences on this airplane uh, that didn't come along with uh, some of the changes that went into the L model off the C model. So just as a general overview, what you can see, this is about, uh, in this configuration, the airplane went from about a 9,500 pound uh, empty weight to about 10.5. Uh, that This is a little bit higher because this is a very special aircraft. We've got four of them in the hangar here. These are the only DC, 28 volt DC uh, operated A4s that were ever built. They were all done as post modifications. Uh, the rest of them were all AC and with the exception of the, the uh, Mike model, uh, which had uh, the uh, J, or the, the Pratt and Whitney J52408. That was the other one that could that, that could start on its own without having to have a huffer cart. What's unique about these L models? We have four of them that are set up this way. They have two uh, instead of all the avionics that came with the airplane. Those were removed, and then there are two 28 volt DC batteries and two uh, rotary inverters that are up in the aircraft to provide both DC and AC power for the airplane, which is really unique. This still does have a ram air turbine or RAT. You can see here is the refueling probe. This was the straight refueling probe, and this came on the early models. On the later models, we get over to the other one, you'll see that it, uh, it has an offset. Uh, but you'll also notice there's a tremendous difference between the canopies. I'll show you that de in a little bit more detail later. Uh, this was a basket style plug, so it's got this ball nozzle up here. When you plugged into the basket, and usually a basket, and let's say for example off the KC-130, which was the primary refueler for the Navy and the Marine Corps, uh, versus the KC-135 or the KC-10, which the Air Force would use, and it's a probe that comes down off the back of the aircraft and refuels, uh, usually over the top into a docking port. but. Uh, this, in, in the case of most Navy Marine Corps aircraft, or all of them, they were all made with, with probes, and the probes would plug into a basket. And so you'd get up to about 250 knots, get behind the airplane, about an 85-foot hose would come out. You'd get up into position after communicating on the radio, plug into the basket and push, and, and let that, but that uh, hose re retract about five to 10 feet, turns on the fuel, pumps it in, and the fuel goes straight into the tanks and would fill up the tanks. And uh, in fact, if we, uh, if we had drop tanks on the outs on the outboards or even all three stations, if we had them in there, typically not. If you had a, a bomb load or, or some other type of armament, 
you might have that on some stations, maybe a tank, only a tank in the middle or only tanks on the outside. They came in three styles. You can see on this aircraft, 150 gallon tanks. Uh, we also have on this outboards, we have 300 gallon tanks. Some of them are in the hangar. And then we had a 400, either a 300 or 400 gallon option that could go on the center line. This would, uh, we've got a switch in the cockpit for refueling. We just turned that switch on. And of course we could fill up both the external tanks and the wings and the, uh, and the, what we call the bag, which is the, the uh, main tank for fueling, uh, for running fuel to the uh, to the nozzles and running the aircraft, uh, running the engine itself. Uh, up in the nose here, we'll just go front to back. Up in the nose here was the uh, AN uh, the APG 53 radar was the one that came in this aircraft. It was an air to air air to ground radar. The APG 53 has been replaced over time by a number of uh, of much more capable models. Uh, the ABG 53 we had one model left in the in the hangar, but it's uh, basically a relic at this point. Uh, it would have been. It had a, a scope screen inside that gave you a reflection. You could you could pick aircraft out there, not at a huge distance. And I don't think the APG 53 was good for more than about 20 or 30 miles at the most. Uh, not and not incredibly capable, but good enough at least to be able to to see a bad guy and and start thinking about what you're going to do. Uh, on the aircraft itself, as we move around it, um, you can see that we got statics uh, here up in the nose wheel well, and get a feel for a, a few things here. One is. Um, very important. This is the air, part of the air conditioning unit, the ACM. Sorry. Uh, the ACM is really important because this thing can get hot and sweaty, especially when we're flying this down in Florida you know, in the summer, uh, being able to turn this thing on. In fact, you, you can see in some videos on occasion, you'll see what looks like fog or smoke blowing into the cockpit, and it's actually just all the humidity, this uh, dry air coming through the ACM blowing into the, into the cockpit. Um, on the nose wheel strut here, uh, a couple of things to point out that are kind of interesting. You can see that the aircraft itself sits at about a six degree nose up. It was, a, it was an aircraft carrier capable uh, aircraft in, in its original design. It has a tail hook on the back, and we'll talk a little bit about when we get a, a background of the back. But I bring it up because, uh, num number one, the angle at which the aircraft sits was to be able to hit the deck, catch the wire, and allow compression of the nose strut. Landing gear you see now developed on the F-18 or maybe even, you know some of the other aircraft that are out there that are carrier-based. Uh, a lot different assemblies that they have for absorbing the shock of hitting the deck. Typically a 3 to 4 G, 800 to 1200 foot per minute rate of descent and hit the deck, catch the wire and bring the aircraft to a stop. We'll come back and talk about that a little bit more later. Uh, one of the things that's interesting here, you can see this is a castering, free castering wheel. So both of these aircraft have free castering wheels. Uh, in the later models, uh, the F model and on, it actually had nose wheel hydraulic steering. So there was a couple of hoses that came out and went down to the nose wheel, and there was an actuator assembly, and there's a, a button on the stick that allowed, would allow the pilot to turn the nozzle steering on or off. And so we typically use it for taxiing around when we get out to the runway. Uh, once we're out to the runway, we'd get fired up down the runway. As soon as we had uh, a transition, as soon as we had enough airspeed for the uh, rudder to... to uh, basically be able to control the direct, give you directional control of the aircraft, you could let go of that button. So, you know, 60 to 80 knots, 60 to 80 knots, let release it, and uh, off the deck you go uh, with just nothing but rudder pedals to control, you know, release the button, and then you've just, you're just using the rudder itself to, to provide directional control. In this case, with a free castering nose wheel, the only way to control the direction of the airplane for taxi and takeoff and landing is the main brakes. And so the main, the, the left and right main brakes uh, as you apply the brakes individually, you would force the nose to caster one way or the other. So uh, what that gives you is a crosswind limitation on this airplane, and it's uh, it's 15 knots. Uh, worst landing I ever had was 17, 18 knot crosswind in terms of crosswind. Uh, and this, it's like, it's like you hit the runway and it's doing, you do a big banana to try to keep it on the runway. And you just have to fight it because you don't, if you, if you press too hard on a pedal, you stop that wheel because it has doesn't have any skid like you find in a lot of modern jets. What will happen is you just get a big donut on the uh, you get a flat spot on the tire. If if, it, if that wheel locks up, and next thing you know you've skidded the tire. You run the you know you take the rubber off and the tire goes flat. And there's an old joke amongst all, all the uh, older A4 guys. They'll tell you there uh, there are two kinds of pilots: those who who've uh, flattened a tire on a landing and those who will. <laughs> Uh, every every one I've ever talked to, is at one point or another, somebody's flattened a tire. I'm sure there's probably plenty of A4 pilots that haven't. I've flattened one. That was it. But uh, I learned my lesson. Uh, so the nose wheel steering was was a really important feature 
Um, one of the other things that's interesting too is there are actually two settings for the for the nitrogen pressure in here. One is for field linings, and it's a much lower uh, setting. And then there's a, and you can see here here's the here's the nose gear tire pressure, 160 psi for land based aircraft. On the carrier, it's 325 psi. It's huge because it's got to be able to absorb that shock of the air, of the aircraft hitting the deck, catching the wire. And what's interesting is that with the hook down, it's pressure it's pressurized down. It's got uh, about 900 pounds of, of nitrogen pressure on the hook when it's down to hold it against the deck and catch the wire. But that also actually forces it puts pressure on the nose when we do when we've done practice runs where you land just doing what we call uh, field carrier landing practice on the runway with the hook down you fair bury the nose pretty quick and you're <clears throat> full throttle and back off the ground bring that hook back up uh, this particular unit here uh, when the aircraft carrier sorry excuse me when the aircraft was aboard the carrier uh, this would have been used to lash the aircraft to the deck in in, uh, in bad seas or in bad weather uh, there was a chain system that would they would wrench the aircraft down and of course this just helped with not over compressing the strut so uh, pretty useful. This is uh, just a shimmy damper. So when you, once you get take, taken off and rolling down the runway, you don't get nose wheel wobble. That's uh, that's a little that would be a little unnerving. <laughs> right here is the rat. And interesting. I know these get talked about a lot. We're actually gonna I'll pop it I'll pop it here in a little bit and let you see what this is, what it looks like. It's actually a Ram Air turbine motor. It's got a propeller on it. And uh, we'll pop it in a little while and I'll show you. I'll climb up there and pop it and I'll show you in a little bit. Um, so as we work our way back, you'll notice here the gear doors. Uh, this uh, this taxi th this taxi light is extremely bright. Had it on last night, taxiing back in in the dark, and it works very very well. It's actually a little blinding if you're standing out in front. We always flash this when we're ready to taxi out as a pilot. We're letting the ground crew know we've gotten permission to taxi. And when we come back in, as soon as we pick up the lineman and he, and he gives us our line for our parking spot, we we flash it to let him know we see him and we turn it off. And that that way we're not blinding guys at night. Uh, under here, I'll show you the, in the main wheel well here, <clears throat> uh, you can see a lot of hydraulic lines. There are two gauges right here. These gauges, and you can, you can move around and see the gauges from the other side here. Those are the hydraulic systems. We have flight control and utility hydraulics, and each of those run at 3,000 PSI. And one of the checks we do when you, walk, when you watch a walk around, you'll see that the, uh, that the ground, uh, uh, our uh, plane captain, or, or, or the chief in this case, whoever's doing the ground runs, he'll come up and he'll give you three and three. And what he's telling you in that particular case, in the initial walk around of the aircraft after the engine's running is, hey, I've got 3,000 pounds of pressure on both hydraulic systems. Hydraulics are, are good. That's really important. That's one of those important cues for us that everything's going to work like it's supposed to. Uh, <clears throat> you'll see the uplock here and the uplock switch uh, for the landing gear once it's up in place. And these, the, uh, the gear, as they come forward, they'll unlock and they'll come forward, and <clears throat> the tire will rotate and fit right in the hole right here. The, um, there's a hook right here, <clears throat> this, uh, this assembly right here. What, what's not attached to it was a, is a, a giant yellow hook that can, that's on the aircraft. Ours are removed because we don't, we don't need it, but it was part of the catapult launching system for aircraft carriers. Was attached to a cable system that was attached to the shuttle and the shuttle assembly on the ship basically attached to those two cables and then there was there would be a drawback cable that would keep it that keep the aircraft attached to the shuttle securely the shuttle would fire <sighs> aircraft goes off the front of the deck from zero to uh, 140 160 knots you're at full power when you take off uh, the uh, then the cable would fall away it would fall off the hooks and fall away this is a, a this is one of uh, one of three stations on this aircraft so the L model was a conversion from the C model. The C model had three wing sta uh, two wing stations in the center, so it's basically three stations. The L model had five stations, but some of the L models didn't, uh, not all the L models got the, the five station wing set. Here's what's unique about the wing. The wing is actually one giant spar, and it fits on, it bolts up onto the fuselage, and the fuselage comes apart in two pieces. There's the front and the back. It allowed a crew to come in, they could take the back off, and we'll show you where that line is, unbolt it, pull the tail off, pull the engine right out of the back. I mean, it's it's just a few hours to pull the tail off, pull the engine out, and put a new engine in and put the tail back on. It was remarkable when you think about it in terms of maintenance. Very, very easy to take this airplane apart. But what it made it unique was that this wing assembly is is uh, it's very, very strong, uh, but it allowed it to maintain a very light weight. So it is, the, the wing is full of fuel. It can be pressurized to transfer fuel up into the uh, into the bag. Of the three stations here, you can see one, two, and three. This is the only one with both 14 and 30 inch lugs. We've got 14 inch lugs on the inside right here. 
there are 14-inch lugs here and 30-inch lugs there. What's the difference? Well, a 30-inch lug gives you a lot higher weight capacity that you can carry on the bottom. The wings only had 14-inch lugs, and those have a much lighter capacity, usually typically 1,500 to 2,000 pounds. This could, uh, the 30-inch lugs can carry up to 5,000 pounds, although the weight limitation on this one is about 3,500 pounds, give or take a little bit, just to, in the ballpark. Uh, you can also see while we're down here on the main wheels, uh, what's really fascinating about the main wheels, <clears throat> and I believe me as I've changed tires and brakes on this up on the maintenance crews, it's always a great experience for a pilot to be able to do that. Uh, here you've got we've got the struts, and the struts are, are always set up with nitrogen and oil, and the struts are set up so that the pressure on the struts, there's actually a chart on the other side, but the pressure on the struts set up for the weight of the aircraft. So we'll always judge the height of this based on the current weight of the airplane to make sure that, that, that it's good throughout the range of weights. As the aircraft burns off fuel, these sit the struts will sit in a different position. All we want to make sure is we don't get complete compaction on them. Uh, what's el what else is unique is right here, you can take a bottle jack. This is how simple it is. You put a bottle jack under here, jack it up, remove the tire off the, the, the tire assembly off, and then let all the nitrogen out of the tire. And once all the nitrogen is out, you can unbolt it and, the, and the, the wheel comes apart in two pieces. And then we would replace the tire and the tube. And uh, the secret to that is baby powder. We put baby powder in the inside so the rubber doesn't stick together. Put the assembly all back together, bolt it all down, fill it up with nitrogen and slap the th slap it back on here and it's it's a remarkably simple change so even a uh, you know even somebody like me can do that <laughs> I'm just kidding you know it doesn't matter how in mechanically inclined you may be uh, it's always fascinating to look at great engineering designs and that was one of the hallmarks of, of Ed Heinemann's design with this we typically leave the gear pins installed until the aircraft is up and running once we have good hydraulic pressure we'd pull the pins and the pins will go in a bag and I'll show you that here in the back in just a second uh, and it's a, as a safety measure, once we land and come in, before we shut the engine down, we put those pins back in. We'll move outside here for just a second, off over here to this side, and show you this unique assembly here. <coughs> Ladder assembly. Now, <coughs> the reason this is on here is because we don't have any tanks on it. If we had the 300 gallon tanks on it, you can actually stand on the back of the tank and step up onto the back of the wing and you can move up and back and forth on the back. That's kind of neat. So this is, a, this is a fascinating design here. This is an aerodynamic slat and that's exactly what it does in flight. The aerodynamic slat is designed to work off of gravity and air pressure. So basically, uh, by about 200 knots, this thing is fully retracted up against the wing and we're just flying angle of attack and thrust. But as the aircraft slows, the slat was there to give us uh, uh, increased lift on the wing. And you really want that when you're trying to slow the aircraft down to hit a little tiny postage stamp and, uh, and catch a wire. These are, uh, these are vortex generators that help keep airflow attached to the top of the wing for, for lift. But these slats move in and out and we actually do a, uh, a test when we go out on functional check flights which we did a couple yesterday. And one of the checks that we do is to put the aircraft into a tight bank and, and, and then and really pull back on the stick and put some G-force to slow the aircraft down. And as we increase the angle of attack, what happens is the, the wing, right, we slow the aircraft down. As we slow the aircraft down, these slats will actually drop out. And what I'm looking for on the turn is the inside slat drops all the way out. Turn the other direction, the inside slat drops all the way out. And it's just to make sure that they're, uh, they're functioning correct in terms of airflow separation over the top of the wing. So that's kind of fascinating. You can see that as you look at the vortex generators, there's two sets, and here's the second set. And you can look and see how big this aileron is. Now you'll notice it's a delta wing, uh, which gives you lots of wing loading, and it's but still with the, uh, with, the, with the swept wing, we're still capable of high speed, but the delta wing gave you a lot of wing loading. For this weight, this is an incredible roll rate. This aircraft, uh, there's some argument over what the actual book value is, somewhere between 720 and 800 feet, or excuse me, uh, degrees per second in the roll rate. But I can tell you this, if you snap the stick, no matter how much I turn my head into the turn, if I snap the stick hard enough and roll this thing, it, it, I'll bounce my head off the other side of the canopy every time, it, no matter how hard you try. But uh, I know there's a four pilots out there who've done it and laugh at that too. All right, so this was an interesting uh, addition to the uh, or change modification from the C model to the L model. This is a, a spoiler. You can see the hinge section here. The spoiler actually comes up, and what it does is it basically dumps lift. About 80, 85% of the lift on landing 
uh, is dumped by the spoiler coming up. And on bottom, we have a, sp a split flap and the flap comes down. We usually set half flap for takeoff and then full flap for landing. Uh, the, uh, the spoiler has, what's interesting about the spoiler as well is we have an arming switch. And so you arm it for takeoff and what will happen is with the throttle at idle or below 70%, that spoiler is sitting up high. As soon as you push the throttle forward, it's one of the checks we do also to make sure that at 70% both spoilers go down. Um, the, uh, then once you're above 70%, uh, the, uh, the spoilers go down, you're off and running for takeoff. So that's one of the things that I do. As soon as I get lined up on the runway, the last thing I do, I'm stand on the brakes, push the power up to about 75%, make sure I see the spoiler light go out, that means both have gone down and then run to full power, release the brakes, and let it go, let, let it roll down the runway. One of the things you'll notice here, we flew the aircraft yesterday, we haven't washed it off yet, so we'll be careful when we walk around, but you'll notice there's a lot of oil film. And that's because the right J65 engine uh, basically used oil and bleed air to cool all the bearings, but it would vent that oil overboard. And you can see there's an open hole there on the side. That's actually where the oil is coming out. And it would come out and just sort of sprays down the back of the aircraft. Because it spills overboard every time we fly it, you know, we've got to come back and put oil in it. Eh, one to two quarts, uh, you know, maybe a quart for every couple of hours of flight time depends on, you know, uh, a lot of factors. But that's an average. Uh, if I go fly it for a couple hours, I might add one to two quarts uh, to make sure that we keep the oil level full. And we do that up on, up on the top. As we come back here, right here on both sides, these are the speed brakes. And the speed brakes, basically, we have a switch on the throttle. It's, it's, your, it's a thumb switch. Uh, we have an ICS switch where we, we can talk on the radio. Um, and then we have a switch right below that is the speed brake switch. And we pull it back, right? Back is stop and forward is go. Uh, so just like the throttle, push the throttle forward to go. Speed brake switch goes forward. These are remain flat against the aircraft. As we pull it back, the throttle back, we'd pull the switch back. And they, they would basically, they open like this and you'll see in the flying videos you'll see the, the speed brakes come out and go go back in uh great to, uh, th they're absolutely necessary for slowing the aircraft down and descending because this is a super slick aircraft and as a jet and it does not like to slow down so speed brakes are really really essential for slowing down particularly coming into land down here is the hook and uh oh by the way this this assembly in here so um what used to be in here is no longer in here. All this wiring assembly was part of the AFCS, the Automatic Flight Control System. Uh, ours are removed. Most of those components are not serviceable anymore, and you can't uh, you can't get service on them anymore. So that means every basically everywhere I go, there's no autopilot. You learn how to trim the airplane really well and fly it very carefully. A lot of the uh, guys that I, the older guys that I've talked to that used to fly these said the AFCS was always it, it was not the best AFCS ever built. It was okay, but it wasn't great. Here's the tail hook, uh, the tail hook assembly. Uh, basically, you know, we, it's uh, hydraulically operated. It goes up and down on hydraulic power, but it also has nitrogen pressure that holds it down. This is the gauge that we use, and the nitrogen pressure will hold that will hold that hook down to make sure that it doesn't just bounce off the deck. We want it down. You'll see if you look at uh, videos of, of these of TAs and A4s landing on the carrier. Um, it's just, you're designed as you fly down to catch the third wire and stop the aircraft. And that nitrogen pressure helps hold this when you hit the deck so that it doesn't skip. If you skip and miss a wire and you end up going off the other side, you know, going off the other end, it's called a bolter. Uh, and the reaction that you'll see if you watch those videos too is this, we're, we're trained as soon as you hit the deck, it's full you know, it's basically full throttle. And that is to ensure that if you miss a wire, you're coming off the other side, you've got enough airspeed and thrust to continue to fly, clean the airplane up and come back around and try again. So <clears throat> here in the back, um, we've got uh, uh, two things that are interesting to look at here. You'll see that the, there's external ribs on the rudder. The uh, external ribs were for additional strength because that's a pretty big rudder. Uh, you'll also notice that this entire uh, assembly moves and there's some marks here on the side and that's for setting the uh, trim so we trim the actually we trim the entire uh, horizontal stabilizer uh, although the uh, elevator itself is is uh, a typical elevator that you'd see on a lot of other aircraft and that mark it's on right there is seven that's about right for the average weight we might trim it up higher or lower depending on the total weight of the aircraft for takeoff this original this airplane was designed for 22,500 pound max takeoff weight 
Uh, the other one is 24,500 pounds when they went, when they upgraded the engine. It got uh, it had more capability, so it was able I, I, obviously able to carry more weight. Uh, this particular one, you can see the A4D2N serial number 12774. Uh, it's bureau number 158 148581 uh, is the bureau number, and then uh, of course it's 207 Alpha Tango. On the back here, this is a this is a uh, straight turbojet engine. Uh, the right J65, 8,400 pounds of thrust was the way it was designed. What you'll see inside of here as you look in the tailpipe is this thing we call the turkey feathers, and that's for adjusting the temperature. Uh, the aircraft would be adjusted inside, uh, in, up at the uh, fuel control for the correct uh, percentage RPM range, and then once we got the power set correctly, we'd come back and tune the turkey feathers to make sure that the, that the temperature range matches the RPM range so that they're correct by book value. The aircraft also came with various electronic countermeasures, different boxes and different attachment points, where, and including even even uh, uh, drag chutes that came on some of the some of the A4 models that were built. When the hydro, sometimes the hydraulic system it'll release it loses a little pressure over time. You can see the door comes out just a little bit, so you can kind of get a little bit of a look. 20 millimeter guns, right here. This assembly was not here before, and you'd have a 20 millimeter cannon sticking out of the front of this. The uh, early models, up until the, actually, I think the Mike model was the only one that was designed for a higher capacity. All of them carried 100 rounds per gun, 100 on either side, and actuated by the trigger inside and, and the switches on the master arm panel. The the M the Mike model had a provision for 200 rounds per gun. So it actually carried double the uh, 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 double the ammunition, but it also had the the uh, Pratt and Whitney J52408, which had about 10,200 pounds of thrust, and, and a very very capable aircraft. Um, I mean, a hot rod, big time hot rod. Even though these were all called hot rods, that that one uh, substantially higher thrust. I mean, you're talking, uh, you know, a change of 2,000 pounds of thrust. So. Show you some of the features on the inside of the L model, and then we'll take a look at the uh, the TA as a comparison. So this uh, removed before flight. This is very important. So it's part of the ejection system, and there are several components of the ejection system that were really important. This is an escapack or escape pack. People argue about which name they want to use. I'm not the manufacturer. I don't really care. Uh, I call it an escape pack because that's what it is. It's a pack to allow me to escape in case this thing caught on fire, or if we were, you know, if it, back for the guys that flew these in combat, if something really went bad to get out. So some components of the seat assembly. It has a main rocket motor that's behind the seat that would actually fire the entire seat out. There's a uh, a little bit a little uh, a little rocket motor over here that's part of the seat man. It's called the seat man separator. It would actually separate um, all this assembly away. So that uh, once you were out with the seat, you could get away from the seat itself and come down under parachute. So th there's two assemblies here for the pilot itself. We bolt, we we uh, strap in. We have an upper harness, and that's attached to the parachute. And the lower harness is attached to this seat pan. This seat pan uh, is a uh, basically a survival kit. It's got an oxygen assembly in it, and that that is that oxygen hose which connects to the. Uh, the rest of our oxygen hose, and we're going to show you a little bit. I'm going to put all the equipment on and show you how we put it on if we're going to go fly and, and how we'd hook it up. This is my main breathing hose, but this is the backup hose. If I had to eject, this would provide me oxygen in the descent from an, from altitude, so that I could still breathe until I could get down to a, a density altitude where I could breathe. Typically, lower, you know, less than 12,000 feet. There are three pin assemblies that we have to be concerned about. This is called the head knocker, and believe me, I've hit my head on it so many times, it, does, it doesn't matter how hard you try, everybody's hit their head on it outside, got the nickname. This pin assembly here is to prevent us being able to put, put it up and down. So that would be a hot seat, that would be a cold seat. It's one of the last items to do on the taxi out, is we put the head knocker down right before taxi so we're, the, the seat is fully hot and ready to go. There's another pin back here, and that's this is all part of the assembly that jettisons the canopy and also gets the seat ready to go out. The actual jettison tube itself, the jettison handle itself is inside here. And uh, 
it's also got a pin because it's also an explosive. If you had to blow the canopy, whether you were going to jump out of the aircraft or whether you were going to punch out of the aircraft, if you punched out, there were two ways to do it. We call it punch out. It's there are two ways to eject from the aircraft. This upper handle is is the uh, the best way because it has what's called a face curtain. We would grab it with both hands and we'd pull it down over over the front of our helmet, and it's got a. Uh, uh, a cloth assembly here that would come down and cover your face and that would have you in the correct position leaning back too. Canopy comes off, seat comes out. The quick eject handles down here between your legs. If you were in a, in a, in a situation where you just had to pull it and punch, that's the other option. Uh, we've got several other assemblies that are part of the harness disconnecting from the seat itself. Pulling that handle up, if I was strapped into the seat and it were on the ground and caught on fire, I could, I could pull the canopy assembly uh, the canopy handle, punch the canopy off, I could jerk that handle up and get out with, just jump out, this would still be attached to my back, but I could get out of the seat quickly. Uh, let's see. So, on the left side here, we'll start at the back. We've got, uh, this assembly in the back is part of the anti-G system. And what we've got is the anti-G, and this is an air conditioning system if you had on an air conditioning suit. So th there, are, those are several, there are several different suits uh, that were used for uh, air conditioning and for, uh, uh, for basically creature comfort for the pilot himself. Uh, this is the one I typically use. This is the anti-G assembly, and it has a valve down there. That valve goes up and down. As Gs are put on the aircraft, there's a shuttle valve that allows bleed air that comes into the suit and fills the suit up. And the suit would restrict a, a, the a flow of blood in your legs. It would restrict it back and try to push that blood back to your heart. Uh, next, up, right up above that, we have part of the AFCS, which has been deactivated. And obviously has a big deactivated sticker on it because we don't use it. Next up from that is the oxygen system, and ours, the original aircraft all came with liquid oxygen, and they were replaced in our aircraft, and just because it's much easier to get standard aviation oxygen, we replaced all of those bottle systems, and now our bottles, I'll actually open it in a minute and show you, our bottles now run standard uh, aviation oxygen, and the aviation oxygen is hooked up here, and I plug my mask in here so that I can breathe. It also comes with the uh, mic cord, the uh, headset and mic cord. Once uh, once I plug that in, I can basically then actuate my radio system. Above that, we have <clears throat> the fuel control panel. So we've got the drop tanks. We can refuel in flight. We can pressurize the drop tanks. Uh, that would allow normal transfer. If I in the flight in the flight refuel, that would uh, take the pressure off and allow us to just flow fuel right down there into the drop tanks and make sure they were, were they were full. The primary fuel control this is a primary and manual fuel control manual fuel control is just raw fuel and it's very very sensitive <laughs> uh, primary fuel control uh, was actually metered and it it, uh, uh, it had a uh, bleed air there's a, a bleed air assembly that that uh, works with that to uh, deal with changes in, in air pressure as you go up and down in altitude uh, you don't get that on manual fuel control. It's just raw fuel into the engine. So one of the, one of the important notes is anytime we ever, if we ever had a problem, for, say for example, you, you started getting a little bit of ice. You had to fly through the clouds and got a little ice. We'd, uh, you, you might start having problems with the primary. We would go, we'd pull it all the way back to idle, switch it over to manual fuel control. And when I do this check on the ground, believe it or not, every time we go out, we always run the power up to 70%. RPM, 70% RPM, and then I go to manual fuel control. And it usually goes from 70 to about 85% when it skips that metering system and, and goes straight to raw fuel. It goes up about 15, 20% in engine power. It's pretty remarkable. You can hear it on a, on a pre-flight. Uh, uh, for the left of that, we've got an emergency fuel cutoff. We lift the lever, pull the guard back. That would, emerge, that would give us emergency fuel cutoff. We also have a wing fuel dump in an emergency transfer if we had to pressurize the wings to push fuel up into uh, into the bag tank, which sits right up behind the pilot here. Uh, that's This is the switch for it. Here is the spoiler switch over here, and I'll move the throttle out of the way. Here's the spoiler switch. We arm them below 70%. Those suckers pop up. If I pull that switch back, they'll obviously turn off, or if I had the throttle uh, above 70% with it armed, they would, uh, they would also uh, go down. As I mentioned, we were a little earlier. Uh, this is a manual trim. We have a, we have a, what we call the top hat here for trim. We can do wings and, and uh, basically aileron trim and elevator trim. That's here with the thumb. But this is a manual control and we check that to make sure that we've also got manual control if for some reason that stopped working. Here's the flap panel. Up, uh, stop, and down. 
And the reason we have a stop in the middle is because we usually, as I said, we use half flaps for takeoff, full flaps for, uh, for landing. Return those switches there. Uh, this is part of the approach power compensator. Um, ours are, de are, are, uh, are deactivated at this time. We don't use them. Uh, they would have been typically used for, uh, for carrier landings. Here's that speed brake switch I was talking about. Forward is uh, speed brakes are in. And so forward for go and uh, back for slow. That's the little mantra that we use, forward for go, back for slow. This is the ICS switch. The, this is uh, interesting. It's a friction lock, and it allows me to lock the power. So the throttle has an interesting, uh, there's a really interesting assembly. One of the safety features of the throttle was that if the, you ever had a cable break, uh, the power, the, the, the uh, assembly would automatically move to about 87% power, which is about exactly what you need for landing. So it would go to 87%, you won't get any more, you won't get any less. The only way to kill the engine once you get on the ground is to shut the fuel off. But if the, if the assembly ever broke, it would return to that position. Well, what that also means is that there's this natural spot where the throttle sits at about 86, 87%. The book says 86 to 88 percent, but it, we, you know, 87 is about right. So I push it up against the stop for military power, and it's actually spring loaded. It'll come back. So the only way to get it to stay there is to put the friction lock in, push it all the way forward, and let the friction lock hold it there. That's what we do for takeoff. That way, after I take off, I can put put the gear up, put the flaps up, and dearm the spoilers. Uh, we use the friction lock. It's very very useful. We have the bat. Here's the pit. Here's the battery system. This was not in the original models. This is part of that DC, that 28 volt DC assembly. You'll notice four handles down here. Emergency landing gear. You jerk these handles, the, the gear is uh, let loose and it drops. Emergency bombs. This would drop everything off the uh, off the pylons. Uh, this one here is for manual flight controls. These are hydraulic assisted flight controls. But if we had to go to manual mode for hydraulic uh, for hydraulic failure or something else, I could jerk that handle. And the last one here is the emergency generator. I'll pull that a little bit and we'll show you where the where the rad is. Uh, just some some of our safety lights here, and then the rest is pretty self-explanatory. Your engine gauges, uh, oil pressure gauge, fuel flow gauge, and when you're full throttle, that thing is it's scary to look down there and say, "Gosh, I'm getting it's you know eight between eight and twelve thousand pounds, depending on where the where the throttle set is." And if you're thinking dollar bills in in terms of uh, cost per gallon, that's a that can be a big number really fast. But um, here's our airspeed indicator. And then this is a very, very important instrument, angle of attack. Uh, angle of attack really gives us uh, the purest sense of energy of the airplane as we're flying it. Radar altimeter and a G meter. So yesterday's flight got, what, four Gs? Uh, we were just doing some test flying. So Then we have a master armament panel down here. This is how we would arm everything in the system. These aircraft still have uh, the uh, pylons are still wired for doing work because we do test work for the government. Fuel gauge is kind of interesting. The fuel gauge uh, will register what's in the bag until the bag is full. If the bag is less than full, it's only going to read what's in the bag. And what I mean by the bag is this uh, this uh, rubber bag assembly that's behind the pilot's seat. All the wing fuel. Once that bag is fueled, then it would it would bring it would, it would go up to whatever the total fuel is. Wing pl uh, wings plus what's in the, in the bag. Then I also have an internal external switch, and I can hold that down, and it will move to tell me whatever is in the external wing tanks. <clears throat> On the right side, really self-explanatory. You got trim up there. Everything else is just radio and communication gear. Along the right side over there, you can see the uh, the lights, all the light uh, switches for external and internal lighting, uh, and then we've got our fuses back here in the back with uh, two important switches down here. One is the fuel transfer bypass and the emergency uh, the emergency generator bypass. So if the rat was out and I was able to restore normal power, uh, I would be able to go from, nor uh, from I could use the normal bypass switch to uh, bypass the emergency generator and go back to normal power. So here on the stick, I mentioned earlier the hat. The hat moves up, uh, you know, we move it up and down for elevator trim, left and right for aileron trim. This was an autopilot disconnect button. Of course, our AFCS is disconnected, so that one's not up. This would have been what would have worked off the radar set, being able to move the uh, target around on the radar. Uh, trigger for the guns, and then the pickle switch. It's, it's this common name, but it's the bomb switch. Uh, as I mentioned, if you had hydraulic nozzle steering, there'd be another switch right down here on the front, and that switch would be to activate that hydraulic nozzle steering. Uh, the pickle switch, is that also for the drop tanks if you were to need to release them for combat? Well, it would drop anything off of the bottom, but only if it was if you had it armed down here for emergency selection for all of them. If you had emergency selection and hit that, yeah, you could drop them all. Or you could just jerk the handle and it would release the hooks. 
the, either the 14 uh, on the 14s or the 30s. You could just release the hooks and drop everything off the bottom. In a minute, we'll climb in and I'll show you how, how you actually get strapped into this thing and, and ready to fly. One other thing I'll note, you want to note on this airplane, this canopy, is a, it's a pressure loaded, but it's a pull down by hand. The TA model, standing for a trainer attack, uh, versus the A model alone uh, attack, uh, this, was, uh, th this was developed as the trainer aircraft uh, to uh, get pilots qualified to be able to go out and fly the single seaters, which were typically would fill the squadrons. There were very few squadrons that were active squadrons that flew the TA itself, actually in combat. And they did it, uh, typically it, they were used for uh, spotter aircraft. Uh, they were used for, and, and in some cases, some, at least what with the research I can find, they did a little bit of electronic, uh, some early electronic warfare. Uh, but there were only a couple of squadrons that did that. The remainder were all set up at training squadrons, the last of which, if I remember correctly, was VT-22. I think it was the last squadron. The Marine Corps retired the aircraft in about 1998. I think the Navy finally retired the last of the TAs out of VT-22, I believe in 2003. And then the Israeli Air Force, uh, which was uh, also had, they had a lot of the M models and the TA-4 uh, uh, J models, they flew those until 2015. So they were the last country, uh, other than Brazil and Argentina, they were the last country to um, retire the aircraft. Uh, one thing I didn't talk about that's on this airplane that I didn't talk about on the other one, but it is on all of them, is this guy right here. We looked at the gauge inside, the angle of attack gauge. The angle, there's the angle of attack uh, vane. Funny story about that. Uh, had a mechanic come out here who was visiting uh, with our maintenance chief and brought his girlfriend out there and we made sure that everything was safetyed off in the airplane let her climb up there and see it that's always fun for people to get to come out and actually sit in the airplane and i he didn't realize that that's not a step because obviously there's no label on it that says do not step i guess we thought about that after the fact maybe that had been a good idea uh but he put his foot up there and he's and so we were about to take the aircraft out a few days later and do a functional check flight on some equipment that we'd fixed and had no idea that he had stepped on it and bent it just ever so slightly bent it. So I took off, flew around the pattern, and I realized the airspeed and the AOA are not matching up. They're not, something's not right. Came back in, landed, and uh, and came and and we realized, and we, we couldn't figure out what it was. So I went up and did did another round, went up and actually did some some flight maneuvering to try to figure out what was what, what the issue was. We knew there was an issue, just had to figure out what it was. Got back on the ground and finally realized when we got up there, uh, my maintenance chief climbed up uh, and he, was looking at it with me and he looked down and he just happened to notice it was slightly bent and he said that's it <laughs> so believe it or not the bent one now is a paperweight it sits in my office and uh, and it's something it's a great memory of realizing that you know no matter how experienced we are flying airplanes sometimes there are things that can get you that you just don't see until and you know until it uh, until it bites you and these aircraft will the they're high performance jets uh, you've got a you really, you, the training is intense, and you know it's it's a great privilege to be able to fly them. It also means you got to be incredibly disciplined and and conscious that conscious of everything that you do. Uh, as I mentioned, this is uh, this two seater has a hydraulic electric hydraulic assembly. That piston right there is what actually is is what uh, actually raises and lowers the canopy. And uh, I'll show you down here where the. <coughs> the door for the assembly just to give you I think what we want to do is just show you some of the differences between this and the single the single seater uh, without dinging up the paint this handle actuates this assembly right here this piston assembly which allows the hydraulic pressure the hydraulic fluid to flow up or down and this handle extends out and we use that to pump up or down to get the canopy up once we have the engine running and hydraulic power well you don't need that anymore we've got a switch inside that allows us to move the canopy up and down You'll notice, uh, same thing here, no, no hydraulic uh, nose wheel steering. Everything else you see on this aircraft is relatively the same. I'll just show you some minor differences. I didn't talk about this earlier, but this was part of the uh, landing system. It's a three light system, red, amber, and green light in there. Uh, that was used with a mirror landing system to give you your angle of attack as you approach, uh, as you approach for landing. You'll notice here, as you look at the intake, this is a standoff intake. On the, on the uh, L model, the uh, intake for the J65 was flush with the fuselage. This one is a standoff. Uh, it was a slightly bigger intake, the J52, obviously a little bit bigger engine uh, and, and much more power. 
So that's a, that's a unique difference. And you can tell the difference that intake uh, changed with the J52, which came in the Echo model. So after the Lima, when it went to the Echo, it went from the J65, the right J65, to the Pratt & Whitney J52. It came with three engine types, the uh, P6, the P8, and the 408. Uh, if I remember correctly, the P6 and the P8 were both about 9,400 pounds of thrust. I think there was one that was slightly lower version, was 8,400 pounds of thrust. Most of them were upgraded to the 9,400 pounds of thrust. The big daddy was the 408, the Dash 408. Uh, was 10,001, 10,200 pounds of thrust, and uh, just a rocket ship off the off the ground. When you consider that the average weight of the aircraft was about 10, 10 between 9,500 and, and 10, 10, 10, 10, 5, that's a one to one uh, thrust to weight ratio before you put fuel in it. So with just fuel, it's now keep in mind these aircraft were subsonic attack aircraft. They weren't designed to be supersonic like the F5 or uh, or other aircraft that were built during the time period. They were designed to be, uh, you know, to haul the mail, as we as we would say. And obviously you can see the way they were designed. Uh, they certainly can. You can really, really load this airplane up. Um, only one model of the A4 uh, came with the capability of firing the Sidewinder missile. What's unique was the Shrike. The, these aircraft were, from the L model on, were all designed to be able to carry a Shrike missile. And the Shrike missile was a missile that was designed, it had part of the uh, Sidewinder uh, rocket body, but the assembly, the, the uh, warhead, would actually find an enemy, would, 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 would look for enemy radar, air-to-air -air radar signal, and it would target the radar signal. So a little bit different than, you, than what we'd, we'd look at in terms of uh, an active uh, heat seeker uh, warhead uh, on a missile or something else. But primarily you can see they were really also designed to, to be able to carry a lot of bombs. What you won't see on the side of the airplane here, uh, none of those vent for oil. Oil is all self-contained here. You don't have to, and you got to check it, but you don't have to continue to, to replenish oil in here. So you don't see any ports, speed brakes, tail hook. This one's bolted up right now for the simple fact that we're doing some maintenance. So they're doing some maintenance on the uh, on the actuator assembly, and so it's bolted up in place until the actuator assembly is uh, is replaced, and then it'll be available again. Um, we didn't talk about it here, but this has got a slightly different tail cone versus the turkey feathers that we saw on the other side. Uh, so the J-52 just had a, had a different um, way of measuring the ITT and, and calibrating the ITT. The mechanics will be a lot better to talk to about that than me. I've been out here and, and worked on the process with them, but I'm always up in the front running the engine. They're back here in the back tuning it with what we call the jet cow box. And that jet cow box would actually give, they, they hook it up and it and we switch back and forth between the the engine the uh, engine instruments in the cockpit and the engine instruments on the calibration box and that calibration box allows them to tune the fuel control to ensure that the engine's running exactly where it's supposed to so the fuel control and the and the uh, temperature what we call in interstage turbine temperature itt they can tune those with that jet cow box and get the engines exactly tuned where they're supposed to be uh, other minor differences with the ta you'll see they also have both have spoilers um, these are the 150 gallon tanks as, you, as, uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, so much lighter in weight than uh, the 300 gallon and the 400 gallon tanks. Um, this particular one has had some conversions. Here's the rat assembly. It's, it's, it's different than you see on the A4 just because of where it is, but it basically functions the same way. Um, oh, I think I skipped the, uh, the O2. <clears throat> just to show you the oxygen where the oxygen bottles go, if I can get it open. It's always fun when it's cold. The oxygen goes in here and it plums into the system right here. Uh, we the, These tanks are out for servicing right now. And then, of course, you got filling instructions. But again, these have been converted from LOX, liquid oxygen. LOX is the term we use to uh, standard aviation oxygen. And I think these tanks are out for hydrostatic testing right now, which is why they're not installed on in the airplane. So what we'll do is... Uh, we're going to give you a little tour of the TA cockpit, give you, show you just a few of the differences here, uh, and you'll see, obviously, you'll see some of the similarities too. And then uh, before we do that, I wanted to show you, here is the bent probe. And you can tell as you look up here from the probe itself, as you look from the probe back towards the cockpit, and we'll go back over to the, to the uh, A4 itself, you'll be able to see the difference. With the change in the windscreen, what you'll see is that the windscreen is wider, We've got a square center window instead of the uh, the uh, elliptical center window, and you've got much more windscreen here. And so moving this out, uh, you've got much better visibility from there than you do trying to plug it from the front. Uh, but because the nose itself is longer here, 
it, this, it, it made sense to offset it as well. What I've got is uh, all the equipment laid out. We're gonna put the equipment on, show you what it would be like to get suited up to go fly the aircraft. The first thing we'll do is we'll put on our anti-G suit and uh, these things get replaced pretty frequently because they get really, really sweaty, especially when you're up flying in the summer. Uh, we put the anti-G suit on. And again, there's some great technical descriptions of how some of this equipment works. Uh, and how it protects a pilot from uh, from exposure or from g-forces or from other things there are some great technical details you can read on the Skyhawk Association website for uh, for all the guys out there got my Skyhawk pa Association patch on I'm a member great organization keeping the legacy alive So we'll get the equipment on and we'll get up there in the cockpit and give you a little bit more of the walk around here. And So as I mentioned earlier, the, a, uh, there's a bleed air hose that comes out and hooks into the suit. And that bleed air hose <clears throat> provides pressure. As G-forces increase in the aircraft, the shuttle valve moves and opens and allows bleed air to flow into the hose assembly. And it fills up these rubber pockets inside of, these, inside of the, uh, the leggings here and around the waist and helps force blood back up into the upper body under high G loads, the blood wants to drain out of your brain and that can lead to gray out, black out, and that's, a, that's really, really not good when you're trying to fly an airplane. Being conscious is really important, right? So <clears throat> with the G suit on, the next thing I'll do is put on the uh, harness. The harness assembly is set up to uh, tie into the parachute and to the seat pan, the wrist gate seat pan. Uh, also on mine, I've also got <coughs> this uh, assembly here. This is a uh, life vest, and the life vest, if I was to pull those two, they're CO2 cartridge activated, and the life vest would inflate both here around the neck and around the body, and will allow me to float in the water. When we go through initial training in Pensacola, everybody gets to float around in the water with those on, and you get a feel for how they work. Never likes this, the uh, shoulder patch. Okay. Get her. Get it all put together here. Got a chest harness. Okay, with all that on, don't want to lose my Skyhawk patch there. Okay, what's the rest of this stuff? Well, I need my breathing mask. The original was an MBU-12. There may have been a version before that, but the one that was used for years is the 12. It's been upgraded to these fantastic masks. I think the Air Force actually commissioned these, but uh, and I believe the nomenclature is the MBU-20. Uh, fantastic. Uh, improvement over the older ones. A few other items need gloves, checklist, uh, or pre flight checklist, checklist for operating the aircraft, a uh, knee board, and an iPad that's got uh, access to uh, all the uh, uh, external equipment that I need. We've got uh, an ADSB unit that we can put up inside and I can track everything there. So just show you what it all looks like when we're in there and then we'll climb up inside and this helmet most of the time you'll see the Air Force 
Air Force helmets were usually painted gray. I left mine gray, I don't need it white. Most of the Navy Marine Corps helmets are painted white or they're given uh, some other type of uh, tape assembly on it so they're highly reflective. Typically that would have been for being able to find you if you were floating around in the ocean. Um, of course, a lot of them guys would paint their names on them, everything else. I, I added this with a cable into my system. It's for uh, noise canceling. The jet engine's really loud when we're running around and it, it's really nice to be able to turn that on and kind of block all that frequency out of there. So we slide down in here and you can see it's it's pretty tight. <clears throat> the seat's set a little bit high right now. I'd have to run the seat back down, put it in a lower position, but at least you get a good you can get a good feel for how we fit in here. And we'd put kneeboard on, iPads here, and visibility, particularly in this one with this big canopy, is really, really good. A little harder to see behind you um, in the uh, single seater. So we take these hooks and we just snap in and then we pull the strap down. That's an example of a strap into the, to the seat here with the shoulder assembly. Shoulder assembly comes over the top and I'll just show you on one side. So that's how we would strap into the parachute. We'd be tied into the seat and into the chute. The oxygen assembly in this one has been uh, removed temporarily for uh, repairs but the oxygen assembly would come up and plug in right here and then that what we saw in the in the L model <clears throat> the oxygen bottle that's in the wrist gate seat pan has that rubber tube and it would connect right here then I'd connect this up to my communications and connect that down a uh, couple of other unique features in this airplane Obviously, you can see here, here's the gear handle we we're talking about that, that uh, we saw on the other side. Uh, this assembly right here is for locking the canopy when it comes down. Uh, we don't have that in the other aircraft. In the other craft, we have a handle down here, and we push, we pull the canopy down, hold it in place, push the thing, the handle forward, and it locks the rollers in place and then seals it. So the aircraft does have um, uh, pressurization inside, but the pressurization is still designed to, for, for a pilot to run on oxygen. Uh, you'll notice that in this aircraft, the uh, head knocker is up, not down. These seats are currently disarmed. Uh, they're uh, undergoing service. This aircraft is being brought up to full flight status here very shortly. But at least it gives you a feel for what it looks like climbing here. What you, one thing I want you to notice, uh, I'm, I'm a fairly big guy. Uh, my arms are touching on both sides. And in that airplane over there, they would be too, which that tells me I'm just too high and the, the seat's set too high. So I'd run the seat back down. If the seat was about three or four inches lower, I'd have plenty of elbow room. I could move around and touch everything. But at this point, my head, my, my uh, helmet would be hitting the canopy up here. So seat height is very important, That's particularly to get the correct angle for coming into land. And while I'm on that note, let me show you something else that's great to see. Along with the angle of attack gauge, in particular, right here at 17, 17 and a half units, uh, that was optimum AOA for landing, for, uh, for, for hitting the deck. We have a little, a little light assembly right here, and you can see it's got a green arrow to point down. It's got a, an amber donut and a red, uh, a red chevron on the bottom. And those, those two chevrons and the donut give us the uh, change in pitch required to meet the optimum AOA to get the aircraft, aircraft to come in and hit the deck. Uh, at just the right, uh, at just the right angle. Have, getting a chance to take a look at both the A4 and the, and the uh, TA4. I hope you've enjoyed this uh, this tour. Uh, certainly glad to have you along for the day and give you a chance to experience these fantastic aircraft that have been flying for uh, so many, so many years. Now, what 60, more than 60 years? Uh, there's such a rare opportunity to get to see something like this still flying there are so few left you can go see them in a museum and hopefully today's walk around will have given you a chance to be able to walk out and see one of those at a museum someplace and know exactly what you're looking at uh, thanks again take care